Well, hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to uh, our panel today. Actually, I'm going to introduce you first. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but no, that's fine. <laughs> uh, and we, they can never be welcomed too much. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Andy Gervich, the president for the Anthropology of Consciousness. And we are excited that you are here with us for our next panel of the first day of our spring conference, our first fully online section meeting in our 39 years of holding conferences. Um, this is, uh, it has been a profound experience so far. The panels have all been absolutely dynamite. Uh, this is, as I said early on, the most diverse, the most accessible, uh, and the conference with the least ecological footprint that we've ever held. And so in spite of all of the challenges we've all faced through the past year and a half and longer, um, we're responding to it in really innovative and really interesting and collaborative ways. And this conference is absolutely the apex of that so far. So thank you for being here and participating in what is really some groundbreaking work with using these digital spaces to connect and share information and build community in ways that we haven't ever done as far as we know in the history of our species. And so it's a very exciting time, um, even as we struggle to figure out what links to click on and how to share screens and how to get our audio to play and all that, it's worth it because we are laying the groundwork uh, for I, what I hope to be several generations of people to take this forward and inter interact and help repair the world in ways that we are yet even able to imagine. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from Portland, Oregon, which as I've said before, rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapua, Malala, and many other tribes and bands. As the original caretakers of this land, uh, I wanna begin my time with you by acknowledging their presence, their dignity, and their continued struggle for respect for restoration and reparation. I would not be here on this land able to be with you today if it were not for these peoples and for their historic and continued displacement. Part of the work of the conference and of this organization is to do our part to help address that. Um, we are in a webinar format. And so if you are not one of the panelists, you'll notice that you don't have the ability to turn your camera on or your audio. So you're gonna to need to turn the chat on and please do that as quickly as possible because we're gonna be communicating a lot of things to you through the chat window. So make sure you have that on so you can be uh, made aware of the things that we're gonna be sharing there. It's also a great place for you to share uh, uh, questions that you have for us, any tech questions or questions that you have for the panelists. Uh, we would prefer that you submit your questions through the Q&A box which is on the bottom of your screen as well. This way we can keep the questions separate from the other kinds of things that are going in the chat box. But if you forget that or don't do that and end up putting a question in the chat box, we'll do our best to grab it and bring it over for the Q&A session as well. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say, and then I'm gonna hand things over to Christina, is that um, if you would like, um, you have the ability to rename yourself up. Uh, if you go click on your name, click over to the right, you'll be able to rename yourself. We ask two things. One, that you go with a name that cl as closely resembles the name you registered with as possible. This way we can reconcile our list of attendees with those who are, are supposed to be here in the room. We're not looking to throw anybody out. We're just looking to maintain security and, and uh, good flow of energy for the conference. And as you can see, some of us have already done if it interests you and if you would like to, and if you think it would contribute to an atmosphere of inclusiveness and a, a welcoming and safe space, you feel free to add your chosen pronouns to your name. This is not a requirement, but if you'd like to do so, we'd be happy to have you do that as well. Okay, this panel is entitled Altered States of Consciousness and Transcendent Change. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to the panel chair, Christina Calicott from Fort Lewis College. Christina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andy. And thanks to my fellow panelists, Elaine Dennis and John Napora, who are going to present as well during this uh, panel. My name is Christina Calicott. I'm coming to you from Ute lands in Southwest Colorado. Um, and I'm going to present a paper entitled or a presentation entitled Amazonian Shamanism and the Chemical Turn, Reengaging the Material and Ontological Studies. Let me turn on my timer. All right, so in 2013, I wrote a paper on interspecies communication for Robin Wright's shamanism class at the University of Florida. I was a first year graduate student and had just re-entered the academy after a 20 year break. The paper went on to be published in the European Journal of Eco-Psychology and has since been translated and republished in French and Portuguese. 
According to Google Scholar, it has been cited 27 times. I say these things not to brag, but to illustrate my level of consternation regarding the fact that for a long time, I didn't even believe myself what I had written. The paper was based on very little field research and was largely a literature review on the songs associated with ayahuasca shamanism, songs that are popularly known as Icaros. Now, I am often reminded that not everyone knows what ayahuasca is or knows what the Icaros are. So let me give a brief overview of this field of research. Ayahuasca is a multi-plant beverage or tea used in the Amazon for various purposes. Um, but the foremost purpose is shamanic divination and healing. It is used in a ceremonial setting and shamanic songs or chants, often known as Icaros, are used to guide the process and to evoke the presence of healing spirits. These songs are indispensable in ayahuasca shamanism, and as is often said, that the measure of a shaman lies in the quality and quantity of his or her songs. It is often said that the ikados are obtained through a process of dieting with plants, which entails ingesting preparations of various medicinal plants while observing sp strict prohibitions on food and drink, social and other kinds of behavior, usually while in isolation in or near the forest. In my paper, relying heavily on the work of Eduardo Luis Luna, I argued that these songs constitute a form of communication between plants and people. I used the concept of phytosemiotics to explain how this can be the case. Put briefly, I showed that the secondary chemical compounds produced by plants might generate biological and psychological effects in the body and mind of the shamanic apprentice that are then interpreted and reproduced in the form of song. In the paper I wrote, in the process of interpretation and reproduction, the initiate organizes and codifies these signals into culture-specific mimetic responses, in this case, ikaros. In other words, a particular plant might introduce a, a unique auditory effect in the apprentice. The apprentice then interprets the sound as the ikaro of that plant and strives to reproduce this sound through song. <clears throat> When I first wrote it, the statement was a response to one of the paper's reviewers who encouraged me to speculate about the specific nature of the communication between plants and humans. Even though the idea of speculating made me uncomfortable, as a pre-master's graduate student, I was eager to get published. So the phrase culture specific was basically a logical workaround or a way of saying that any interpretation and musical reproduction of phytochemical cues would be a product of the consumer's musical enculturation more than anything the plants had to say. As my research progressed, I found it difficult to find any shamans whose personal trajectory matched that of the classic literature on shamanism. In other words, that they had dieted with plants for many years in order to learn about the properties of those plants and to acquire songs. Where did I go? It increasingly seemed to me that regardless of the state of the art at the time of Eduardo Luna's field work, by the time I got to the field, shamanic assertions of interspecies communication were nothing more than a means of laying claim to privileged and therefore unverifiable knowledge, a sort of Amazonian esotericism in which a direct and personal relationship with the divine, in this case, Amazon, uh, with plants and their guardian spirits conferred power and knowledge upon its claimant. As my research has progressed, what I've found is, of course, an expansive and complex amount of diversity within the world of Amazonian shamanism, which means that many findings can be true at the same time, including contradictory findings, and including most of the findings that I uh, elaborated in my first paper. Um, I think that in most cases, the songs used in ayahuasca shamanism exhibit signs of greater human agency than plant agency. I might describe them as products of the enculturated human imagination as stimulated and shaped by the action of plants on the mind and body. The prominence of human agency makes the final outcome no less remarkable if we consider that the outcome, if we consider that outcome as a form of co-creation between plant and human. As I wrote in my dissertation, quote, this is the very place where cultural creativity emerges as a result of interaction between human and non-human nature, unquote. Such cultural creativity is in keeping with the processes of adaptation as a core feature of cultural ecological adaptation, a la Julianne Stewart, who wrote that cultural ecological adaptations constitute creative processes, unquote. <clears throat> 
On the other hand, I have seen rare examples in which direct mimesis is also at play. In 2018, I was interviewing an elderly Quechua couple in San Martin, Peru, on the edge of the Peruvian Amazon, uh, about medicinal plants known as pergas. The woman described to me the spirit of ayahuasca. It's the sound of a chainsaw, she said, and she heard it once when she took ayahuasca. Quote, así el ayahuasca bote su, su secreto, unquote. That's how the ayahuasca emits its secret, she said. Her account bears remarkable similarity to that of a Pastaza Quechua woman I interviewed once from Ecuador, who described the voice of ayahuasca by making a sound that I can only describe as that made by the blades of a helicopter in motion. That this quality of sound appears to have been approximated by the quickly repetitive, almost vibrational quality of the vocables in an ikado sung by Jacques Mabit, owner of the therapeutic center Takiwazi in Terrapoto, Peru whose primary training was with Lamista Quechua shamans. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, to share the sound of that uh, song with you. This comes from a little clip off of uh, YouTube. All right. All right, so you can kind of hear that really quick uh, vibrational quality, uh, which is what I heard those Quechua women um, trying to reproduce when they made the sound of the voice of ayahuasca. Um, in both cases with these Quechua women, it was clear to me that the sound that they were describing or reproducing uh, was what Western science would call an auditory hallucination. And yet to them, it was the speech of the plant itself. Their assertions are in keeping with the very common Amazonian belief that language is not limited to human or linguistic sounds, and with the finding that non-human language is often quoted in human speech by means of onomatopoeia. In these cases, the emic view is that the sound they heard was the voice of ayahuasca itself. The edict view is that the sound they heard was the psychoactive effect of the secondary compounds present in the plant material. Compounds that as a class tend to serve functions of defense, communication and cooperation, both within the plant itself between parts and between the plant and its environment. The voice that they reported was not only the effect of these signaling compounds on the brain itself, but also the interpretation of the effect of those compounds as a form of speech. This is a process not entirely dissimilar from the interpretation of other exogenous cues. For example, bird song or the sound of a tree falling in the forest. As is generally agreed upon with regard to the latter, for example, the sound of a falling tree is not the vibrations that result, but the reception of those vibrations by the structures of the ear and the interpretation of that stimuli by the brain. A critique of my theory will be that with regard to the secondary compounds present in the ayahuasca plant, that are believed to be its sole source of activity, harmine and harmaline and their relatives, we don't know exactly what the function of these chemicals is. They may or may not be signaling chemicals. My response would be that the isolation of molecules and the attribution of a plant's medicinal qualities to those molecules is a reductionistic approach that not only sidesteps the holistic approach of Western herbology, not to mention Amazonian ethnomedicine, but is also beside the point. Many forms of communication are not intended as such or are readily misinterpreted. This multivalence or even equivocation are true for the communicative, communicative properties of plant secondary compounds as well, in which, is it, in which it is accepted that these compounds may or may not have evolved as signaling compounds, but that the signaling function may be, may be spandulous or a secondary result of their positionality within an ecosystem. It is also observed that many of these chemicals are multivalent, exercising both communicative and physiological functions. The potential for misinterpretation of these phytochemical cues is widely recognized by Amazonian shamans who regularly call ayahuasca a liar. On the other hand, there's evidence that secondary compounds and the psychoactive effect that they produce on the species that ingest them can confer fitness benefits on the producer as well as the receiver. Research on honeybees and caffeine producing plants 
has shown that low levels of uh, caffeine and flower nectar serve to enhance the bee's memories, not just through Pavlovian associative response, but by the direct stimulation of memory encoding brain structures, as well as to stimulate the bee's pollinating activities, leading to increased pollination of the donor plant to the plant's benefit. What's more, the secondary compounds present in some nectars can serve to reduce the pathogen load of its pollinators in nectars, and nectars containing these compounds may be preferentially sought by pollinators for this specific reason. This is, of course, not the only example of self-medication by a non-human species. However, the increasing body of research on the mediation of, of pollinator flower interactions by psychoactive medicinal compounds is important to our conversation because of the widespread recognition that these interactions are situated within a complex and ecologically sophisticated system of interspecies communication involving indexical flower signaling, bee dances, and more. <clears throat> My contention that the spiritual beings of the plant world are related to their chemical constitution is supported by Michael Uzendowski and Edith Kalapucha Tapui's account of gathering medicines with their healer friend, Fermin, who's Quechua also of Ecuador. As they walked through the forest, Fermin broke off leaves and stems, tasting and smelling them in order to assess their strength. Their aroma was evidence of their power, they write. However, the idea of power wasn't limited to a biochemical assessment but to an assessment of the plant's personhood. Certain flowering specimens, Fermin described in a way that equated them with shamans. <clears throat> Earlier in this presentation, I used phytosemiotics as a theoretical framework for describing the communicative properties um, where did I go? of plants and the indexical quality of their signaling compounds as they exert their agency upon the human body. Others have used the concept of ecosemiotics to describe the incorporation of plants into human sign systems. I suggest that neither of these is quite adequate to accommodate a communicative system in which plants and humans are embedded together within a web of chemically mediated signaling compounds. In a 2019 essay, John Hartigan writes about plants as ethnographic subjects, inquiring into the means and methods by which ethnographers might investigate, evaluate, and write about the social lives of plants within a world of other plants. Again, his investigation is limited to the plant world rather than the broader world of humans and plants. But his essay is firmly embedded within the ontological turn as is mine. <clears throat> In this essay, Hardigan uses the language of quote unquote, the chemical turn to describe what may be an emergent form of ethnography that engages with plant chemicals to describe and understand plant sociality. I suggest that we broaden the scope of the chemical term and recognize that as part of the broader ontological term with which Hartigan is engaged, we recognize the co-constitutive nature of humans and other than humans and communicative processes, much as historical ecology and ethnobotany have resituated humans as co-creators of what otherwise appears to be a non-human landscape. In other words, humans do not have to dominate a domain in order, to be, in order to be embedded as an active participant within it. <clears throat> now in approaching the ontological turn, I want to acknowledge its critics, but also to push back against them. On the one hand, some critics seem concerned with the abstraction or romanticization of indigenous culture inherent in ontological queries. I think I've shown here, however, uh, that the human and other than human beings that populate the landscape of the ontological turn are not abstract, but are in fact quite material biological beings. The involvement of the human mind and imagination in these communicative and representational processes does not diminish that fact. Another critique of the ontological turn is that it decenters de the struggles for survival of the indigenous groups with which it is concerned. Again, I reject that notion. The, ethno the ethnography of religion or shamanism is not antithetical to political ecology and indigenous rights. The work of Richard Chase Smith, ethnographer and founder of Peru's Instituto Bien Común, which is one of the preeminent um, organizers for indigenous territorial rights in, in Peru, should be proof enough that this argument is flawed. Likewise, in my own investigations into shamanic music among the Quechua of San Martin, Peru, I found that when shamans call to the spirits, other, plant, other spiritual and elemental forces, as well as of human, oh wait, I found that when shamans call to the spirits invoking them to come join them in ceremony, and I should clarify that these are spirits of plants, other spiritual and elemental forces, as well as of human healers, both living and deceased, 
They do so by naming sacred sites in the landscape of San Martin where these healers and healing forces are said to reside. Now what's particularly relevant here is that these sacred sites lie in the mountainous regions of the regional landscape in territories that have either been lost to colonization and to agricultural um, expansion or that have been set aside in conservation areas that are in effect off limits to the Kichwa. The Kichwa are actively engaged in a number of legal battles to regain access to and title to these territories. My Kichwa colleagues were not only delighted to discover the Cosmovision, that's their word, embedded in shamanic song that I presented to them, but we have used these findings in a paper that aims to support the Kichwa claims to these territories as sacred sites, which according to international law, should be returned to the Kichwa, if not in full title, at least in access and co-management with regional authorities. That's all I have for you today. And thank you for your time. So now um, we're going to turn to Elaine Dennis. She's got a paper for us. She's from John F. Kennedy University and her paper is entitled Sacred Plant Medicine, Treatment Resistant Conditions and the Transformation of Identity. Nice. All right, thank you. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, Andy, um, and the Society for Anthropology of Consciousness. Um, I want to recognize the lands of the Wapa people here in Northern California, where I live. And um, yeah, so um, thanks again. It's great to be here at the Sea Change Conference and present um, the research um, from my paper and my inquiry group, uh, the topic is sacred plant medicine, persistent conditions and transformation of identity and definitely an area we're seeing a lot of sea change in with psychedelic medicine, plant medicine, and specifically treating a lot of these um, treatment resistant or persistent conditions and um, so I'm presenting a paper and research that was part of the second year of my consciousness and transformative study program. Um, and I will go into uh, my launching statement, which is illness and healing and psychedelic medicine experiences can all have profound and significant effects on people's lives. There is a theme of rites of passage in both illness and psychedelic experiences. Rites of passage typically have the phases of separation, initiation, and return. In illness, there can be phases of rejection, engulfment, acceptance, and enrichment. Okay, so in psychedelics, the phases are preparation, your setting of your um, intention, set and setting, and then engagement, and then integration of the experience. And the question that I had was about identity. How is identity transformed on this path from illness to healing with psychedelics? And so um, that brings me to my journey and how I ended up here today talking about healing and plant medicine. Um, I started my career in Silicon Valley and I was an evangelist for core technology for Adobe and Apple, which um, took me into the music area and digital film digital music, eventually I found myself working in the bowels of the entertainment industry in Hollywood. And it's very fast paced, overstimulating, chaotic, doing energy. And um, 10 years ago, I woke up one morning and I was like, are we having an earthquake or what? And it felt like the ground was moving. Um, and I had had a sudden onset of subjective dizziness there was no earthquake it was basically just happening within my nervous system and uh, I had a lot of rocking and swaying and brain fog because the symptoms didn't resolve and uh, it took me about nine months to actually find a doctor that knew what was going on I had a neurological um, diagnosis of silent migraines vestibular migraines so that's your equilibrium and your ability to balance, which is why I felt like I was off balance. Um, 
I also feel that there was definitely a trauma component involved as well. And this kind of went on for a while at varying intensity and started to become more intrusive in my life over time because I was sensitive and everything became a trigger, motion, computer use, crowds, sounds. And eventually, um, you know, it really affected my quality of life. I had difficulty focusing and functional issues and I basically became chronic because my symptoms didn't resolve and were causing me um, impact to my functionality. And so I basically went through that stage of separating. I uh, left Los Angeles and moved to Northern California. I slowed down on my work and my social. I put a pullback. So I went into the separation, isolation, and um, I basically tried everything under the sun, you know, Western medicine, pharmaceuticals, alternative treatments, therapies, and basically nothing worked for me. I was treatment resistant. Um, and so I had at this point decided to go back into school. I was, I was seeking out psycho-spiritual material. And so I found the program at John F. Kennedy for Consciousness and Transformative Studies. And so there I, I learned about healing in expanded states and the work of transpersonal um, uh, psychologists and Stan Groff and the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, MAPS. And I also was learning about some work that was being done specifically on treatment resistant conditions like major depressive disorder of which 30% of those uh, cases are treatment resistant. PTSD, 40% of those cases do not respond to traditional treatment. And also a lot of people with migraine disorders do not respond. So I had read about some studies specifically where people with migraines were healing with the plant medicine. So in, um, 2019, I weaned off all of my medicine and I uh, went on multiple intentional med medicine ceremonies, including ayahuasca, psilocybin, and I also worked with MDMA and psilocybin together. Um, and then after these experiences, I was able to stay off. I never had to go back on my daily uh, pharmaceutical medicines that I had weaned off of, and I remained low in my symptoms. Um, the thing that I noticed was that I was definitely having identity issues. I wasn't my former self that I had been before the illness, and I was not consumed, engulfed by the illness because my symptoms had been reduced. So I went on a search for other people who had this similar experience. Um, and so I started to um, put together a study around that. And um, here I'll just go into a little bit of the literature from my paper. Um, Dr. Stan Groff, who you probably are familiar with, is a psychiatrist who was among the first to work legally with LSD in the 50s in Prague and then later in the United States. And he worked with thousands of patients over a couple decades. And um, he found that unconscious ma emotional material reliably emerged in these psychedelic sessions, wherein the psychogenic symptoms that people were having, and in some cases there were people with uh, skin disorders or migraines or, you know, then anxiety and things like that. Um, but these could be tended to and thus healed. And so he really paved the way for a lot of what we see now in the renaissance of research um, going on. And John Hopkins has been doing a lot of research. They have hundreds of papers and have worked with lots of different medicines and um, conditions. And one of the one of the uh, observations that they have made is that high doses of psychedelics that um, pro provide this mystical experience for people in which 
they have a sense of unity, interconnectedness, um, transcending space and time, etc. And it's in those states where the therapeutic benefits um, come. So, and, and lasting effects on people's behavior and their mood. Um, and then I also looked at the rites of passage um, literature as it pertains to illness and um, the phases that we talked about a little bit earlier about separation, how illness pulls you away from your work and your, your family and friends, um, the more you get consumed in it. And, um, you know, there can be an incorporation if your symptoms are resolved. Um, there's also something called illness identity. There was a paper written about this um, chronic uh, illness in adults and the identity, the degree to which um, the illness is integrated into someone's identity. And um, so people with chronic illness can cycle through the phases or remain in any one of those phases. So rejection and engulfment are associated with maladaptive, um, psychological and physical functioning. And then the acceptance and enrichment is, you know, when you've moved into a healthier place with your illness. Um, so I, I started a cooperative inquiry and cooperative inquiry is a, um, a, a group that I started for inquiry into the shared lived experiences um, around illness. And so it's a qualitative kind of research. Um, and I was a participant as well as a researcher in the group. So I put together the criteria for participants is based on my own experience. And um, so participants were 25 or older. They had had a persistent illness for five or more years and they had used psychedelics as a therapeutic and then had been low in their symptoms for one year following the psychedelic use. So we had six weekly meetings on Zoom um, that were about an hour and a half usually. And we, um, the process of inquiry with cooperative inquiry is that you go through cycles of action and reflection. So as a group, we decided what we wanted to look into in our experience and then how, what kind of a practice we were gonna use to, to go deeper into what our experiences were. So then we came back after that into the next meeting and shared those, those reflections with others. And then we kind of reframed them and figured out what we learned from the actions that we took. And that's really kind of the cornerstone of how cooperative inquiry works. So everybody agreed that identity was an important part to inquire into and they all wanted to do that. So the first inquiry that we did was a dialogue with our illness or illnesses and in the first person. And so that was really interesting, the shares that um, we had. And um, one of the reflections that came from a participant about that was that I became the illness, it possessed me and dominated my life. And that reflects the, the, um, the, the research that, you know, persistent health um, symptoms can basically um, engulf a person and then upend their sense of themselves. So affecting their identity because they've pretty much become consumed by the illness. And then the second inquiry we did was writing a letter to the medicines. So, you know, in some cases there were lots of, the letters were long because there were different medicines that people had tried and different experiences and things that they wanted to express. And that was really interesting and fruitful. And I just pulled some excerpts. Um, one person said, thank you for teaching me about surrender, forgiveness, and bringing me back to joy. 
Another person wrote, I felt deeply humbled in your presence. I felt the deepest compassion for myself and every living thing. And another um, part of this is sort of goes to what you were talking about, Christina, is they were, there were many experiences of, um, you know, spirits, the plant spirits and um, guiding entities or um, entities that were helping to remove energies and things like that. So it was, um, it was a really interesting inquiry. And uh, we, we found that high doses of psychedelics do convey those mystical states wherein, you know, people can surrender and have greater self-compassion and self-confidence and the shifts can occur where healing emerges. And then uh, we, we did a further inquiry into what were the, the qualities and behaviors of phases that we saw ourselves go through. Like what were the phases that we, we felt that we had gone through and what was our, our behaviors and you know pathologies and archetypes and things around that. So we, we did that one cycle and then we added a visual story component to the second cycle, which was really kind of brought it home because you could see pictures of people in their wounded self stage. And um, basically the qualities that we associated with the wounded self were chaotic and consumed never being gentle with oneself. And then that's sort of that separation engulfment part of um, the rights. And then the healing self, which was um, seeking and vulnerable and confused. And this was sort of in that liminal or acceptance space. And then the emergent self which was um, uh, had qualities of integration, growth, authentic, uh, being more authentic and you know, sort of incorporating knowledge from the experience. And so we also found that you, know, you can overlap in these stages, you're not really clearly in any one or the other and, and people slipped back from where they thought they had been you know, in a more emergent stage to a wounded self stage. So um, <clears throat> those were the phases that we found. And then, um, let's see. Yeah. Um, just being a part of the group, the process of deep inquiry with peers was in itself part of the integration for people and was very healing and enriching. Um, the cooperative inquiry provided a framework and a safe environment for deeper exploration of this journey from illness to healing and uh, a couple quotes. Um, someone said, I consider this part of my integration these inquiries help me to realize my own transformation. And then, um, yeah, the group process served as further integration through the witnessing and the sharing of the stories. So another person wrote, hearing others be so open and vulnerable was very powerful. And, um, you know, it was really, incredible because the group actually wanted to continue working together when we finished our six cycles <laughs> and everybody's kept in touch and actually uh, some of us have actually met in person the people that were close enough to do so so there was a definite bond and and healing through the witnessing and sharing of lived experiences so thank you thank you for the gift of your presence and allowing me to share my story and my research with you. Nice. Thanks for that, Elaine. Yeah. Thank you, Elaine. Next, we're going to have John Napora from the University of South Florida. He's going to talk to us about healing and trance in Morocco. Thank you, Christina. And thank you again, 
Elaine for sharing. That was really interesting. Um, thank you as well to Andy and for the Society of Anthropology of Consciousness for giving me an opportunity to present what I'm going to talk about. And I also want to thank the many Moroccans and Sufis or Muslim mystics that I was fortunate enough to meet during my research in Northern Morocco. In the brief time I have, I wish to expose you to the practices of some Sufis, or again, Muslim mystics, and really a small number of them, small in relation to the number of Sufis worldwide. And if you don't already know of these practices done by some Sufis, they are indeed worth knowing about as they might expand our conception of the human condition and its potentialities. Time permitting, <clears throat> and of course, God willing, I also wish to provide a cultural analysis or interpretation of their practices including noting culturally constructed motives for their actions as informed by the socioeconomic relations in which the practitioners are embedded or enmeshed. Overwhelmingly, the majority of those who practice such acts, which I'm about to mention, are poor, an ethnographic fact that has been supported by other ethnographers of Sufism in Morocco such as Vincent Crapanzano. Perhaps is significant to understanding their acts, the performers of them also <clears throat> lack honor, the overarchingly encompassing and guiding social value in Morocco, and more specifically, honor as prestige. The practices I want to note for your benefit include many acts of self-harm, such as drinking hot boiling water, eating prickly pear cactus, spines and all, self-flagellation with prickly pear cactus, hitting themselves in the head with a sharp object, such as a knife or perhaps a clay pot with great force, slashing at their wrists with a knife and throwing themselves head first into a wall. As there may be many others I have not seen or read about, or ones I am simply forgetting, it is quite possible that those are not all. The acts I saw were typically performed during Sufi rituals at night in someone's home, in the company of both men and women, and were typically done while in an altered state of consciousness. <clears throat> state which can be seen as a condition of trance which was entered into without the use of any drugs or intoxicants. They were also typically performed by men but women also occasionally engaged in similar acts of self-harm and again in mixed company. It may be important to note that other such practices among Sufis exist in other parts of the Islamic world. Again, one has to keep in mind that it's only a small number of Sufis who engage in such acts. Those Sufis amongst the Kurds of Kurdistan may provide the most well-known examples. I also want to point out um, a striking historical parallel that, again, some of you may know about, but if you don't, um, it's worth looking into so-called Jansenists of early 18th century France and seemingly in particular in Paris also engaged in huh, literally striking, forgive the bad pun, striking acts of self-injury and also maintained that they felt no pain while engaging in them. To me, it is indeed remarkable 
that those Sufis whom I spoke to about their acts of self-injury maintained they felt no pain, either during or after their acts of self-violence. The obvious question to address, how can that be the case? That quickly leads to another. For at least some of those engaging in such acts, they also maintain they feel, not only do they maintain they feel no pain, but actually that they feel better afterward. How indeed can that be the case? And again, you have a striking parallel amongst the um, so-called Jansenists of early 18th century France after committing their acts of self-violence, they too maintained they felt better afterwards. The answers to such questions likely involve a number of levels of analysis, including psychological ones, such as offering emotional release in a culture, and now I am indeed talking again about Moroccan culture, which offers few emotional outlets um, there are simply too many possible levels of analysis for me to go into here in the short time I have. I should also note that the Sufis I'm referring to in the paper were not one of the groups which were central to my research in northern Morocco. Thus, to quote Evans Pritchard, I do not make far-reaching claims. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry if I disappoint on that, on that point. I should limit myself to what I'm confident in stating and with what is consistent with cultural anthropology. And since Christina mentioned anemic approach, I will also say that at least initially, I'm taking anemic approach relating the Moroccan Sufis actions to their salient categories and to their religious idiom through which they understand their acts. One of their most salient religious categories is the famous baraka, the blessing and power which comes from God. Though its ultimate source is Allah, typically Sufis are followers of a particular saint. The ones I knew in Morocco who were willing to speak to me about their actions felt they were experiencing and participating in the baraka of the particular saint they followed. It was his baraka that was protecting them, thus showing that they had a close relationship with their saint. In Morocco, to be close to a saint, or to again refer to a Moroccan category, to be a worker for a saint brings baraka. They were also demonstrating their nia. And I'll put the term in chat for everyone to see what I'm referring to. And yes, in the Latin letters. Nia is another crucial Moroccan and really Islamic category with a range of entangled and encompassing meanings, including intention or purpose, moral intention, correct purpose, and it's also been translated as devotion or faith. Through their acts of self-harm, the Sufis have shown their devotion or nia to the saint. In turn, the saint rewards them with his blessing, his baraka. The proof of that, and now I'm taking something more of an etic approach, is being able to engage in such dramatic acts of self-injury and not only survive, but also not to feel any pain. How can they not feel better? Their injurious acts mark them not only physically at times, but also as having a special relationship with a saint and through him, Allah. They have been transformed from simply being among the many poor and those who lack prestige to among those who have the baraka. 
like the saints themselves, to whom they have simultaneously shown their devotion and closeness, at least temporarily, <clears throat> excuse me, during and after their rituals, they enjoy, <clears throat> excuse me, an enhanced sense of self. And indeed, from their perspective, I think it's safe to say, a blessed sense of self. And again, the proof of their enhanced personhood is their ability to transcend the physical pain. They, of course, may also be transcending their specific personal pain or pains. And in doing so, I think it also safe to say that they are transcending the oppressive system of economic and social relationships in which they find themselves. In whatever pains, either physical or emotional, they may experience as a result of those. They may lack honor as prestige within the general structure of Moroccan society, but they can affirm or assert their honor as morality, and in so doing, their personhood. They can make a claim to greater honor as morality than others who have no such close relationship with a saint, for they have shown, again, at least temporarily during their rituals, that they have the barakah and at least some can even pass it on to others in the context of their rituals through bestowing their blessings. Again, like the saints themselves and their descendants. Transcendence for such Sufis can be seen as simultaneously deeply religious, moral, of course, social, cognitive, and likely emotional as they transcend whatever forms of pain they be, may be experiencing in their everyday lives, including feelings of being diminished socially and economically. Thus, for the same Sufis, there can indeed be seen some gain for their intense and self-inflicted pain. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Now we have um, about a half an hour left for discussion and questions. And so if we'd like, while uh, attendees are thinking of some questions and maybe posting them in the, in the Q&A uh, and or the chat room, uh, please, uh, again, the Q&A is preferred, but if you post them in the chat, that's fine as well. And if you really would rather speak directly your question, then just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll try to accommodate that as well. But um, in the meantime, do the panelists have any things that they, I saw folks taking notes? Would you like to maybe ask each other some questions and speak to each other about what you just presented for a couple of minutes while the questions mm -hmm. are coming in? Yeah, I definitely had some thoughts um, for Elaine. I don't know if I have a specific question, but I'm sure you can comment on this. Um, one of the things that I find in, uh, and that I've really found very interesting in what I would call traditional Amazonian shamanism, which would be that which is not <clears throat> influenced by tourism, right? Because that's a whole different, a whole different standard. Um, but you know, in traditional Amazonian shamanism, of which there are very many kinds, one of the really consistent things that we see is that um, this idea that all illness is caused by external forces, by usually other people, but sometimes like a, an element in the natural, natural world or an outside other than human being. But they all have these external causes. Um, and what I found really useful for that, I mean, it has its pros and cons, but one of the things that I found useful and that um, one of my shamanic colleagues uh, also recognizes is that that externalizes that illness. Um, and what you're identifying is that people, you know, from our culture where we find uh, the source of illness often to be internal, that makes us identify with it. So. Um, I find it interesting that you're bringing this up within the context of the shamanic and psychedelic studies. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, there is sort of a, a place where people do not, they, they may reject their illness. That is like an illness identity too, where, you know, yeah. you, you don't um, accept it. But I, I can share with you one of the uh, comments from the medicine um, uh, letter that was written by one of the participants um, who, I think this was in an ayahuasca 
where she said she met this being that was scanning. I met this being that was scanning my body and asked him, who are you? And the being responded, I'm you. And she deduced that it was her higher self. And then these beings came in the form of light beings and they were like collective beings, but they were scanning her body and actually um, removing the illness from her. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's sort of like you could see that this is maybe your higher self coming to help heal this this uh illness that has been created within mm -hmm. you yeah that's interesting because that's almost like we're seeing um sort of an identification with the other <clears throat> the other being this other being that then induces the healing that's interesting yeah we have a comment in the chat um that i'll read out for folks and john this is directed at you and then we have a question <laughs> yeah i saw it thank you Thank uh, you. Your other folks. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it comes from Cheryl. And the comment is Gary Schwartz in his lab at the University of Arizona studied the American Sufi, studied an American Sufi, not the one, <laughs> mm -hmm. professor of pediatric psychology at Case Western University and affiliated with the Baghdadi Tariqa, uh, putting a spear through his cheek in an altered state. Uh, uh, Cheryl's actually present for this. The piercing was complete, remained for several minutes and then completely healed up and then 20 minutes after withdrawal. Uh, they all went out to dinner afterwards, and he had no after effects except happiness. Uh, he then prayed. Um, is it, uh, I'm, I'm sure I should turn your voice um, because I'm going to botch these. Uh, Cheryl, you should be allowed to speak now. Is that? Silsila. Or Silsila. Chain of shakyos for power and blessing during the event. Uh, Cheryl is a Sufi herself and happy to talk more about this. Uh, so, John, did you have any response to that? And Cheryl, you should be able to talk now as well if you wanted to, to respond or add any context to that. And then we'll get to Daniel's comment as well. Just to emphasize my um, thanks to you, Cheryl, for sharing that and that practice of putting uh, a sharp object through the cheeks um, is as... as you are likely to know one of the things that the uh, one of the acts that the Sufis amongst the Kurds of Kurdistan are famous for mm -hmm. and experience no pain. <clears throat> and it's absolutely indeed extremely remarkable as what I remember seeing is um, they're putting things that look a lot like they're about the same length as say <laughs> sewing needles through both cheeks and not experiencing seemingly any ill effect from doing that. It is indeed just, my, to me at least, mind boggling. Thank you again, Cheryl. I'd love to hear more. Thank yeah, you. well, Gary was, doing, uh, Gary was doing work on alternative stuff of uh, anything weird. He was especially studying channelers, <laughs> but he found this fellow, and this is a, you know, this is a straight up African American faculty member from Case Western. Came uh, in a suit and tie, sat down in the chair, being videotaped in the whole thing, went into his prayer place, which he said, for him, it's chanting the names of every sheikh, you know, and you do the sheikh, and then his teacher, and his teacher, and his teacher, and his teacher, and his teacher. He knew all those names. That was his mantra or chant all the way back to Muhammad. And wow. he chanted all of those. And then he gave a little signal with his finger that he was ready to do it. And they were videotaping all of this and filming it and measuring his aura and everything you can imagine. And so then they got ready for the, you know, sort of special measurements and stuff. And they had it all on videotape and we're going to show it somewhere. And it was this, re it was remarkable in so it was remarkable in its sensationalness of this piercing happening and everything. And it was remarkable in the ordinariness of this man and how it was for him. And so I just want to support in a way, 
once this is in people's lives, it it's there. It's a huge blessing. But it's every it's sort of every day, you know, it's normal. It was amazing. It was completely amazing. Yeah, it, it really is. And I um, think you're well, I'll put it this way, hopefully um, supporting or at least relating to what I was saying uh, with your comment that seemingly from his perspective, it's seen as a blessing. Absolutely, totally a blessing. And not everybody can do it. It's uh, a sign that you've no, really no. bowed to God. Yeah. And, th and through, in this case, through a saint, in his case, through a chain of shakes. Uh-huh. John, we have another question from Daniel Lindy or Lind. Mm -hmm. Says, John, I enjoyed your talk. I'm wondering about the extremes of self-harm. Was there variation in the amount? And do you have any thoughts on what accounts for more or less self-harm? And then he follows up by saying, I'm more interested in the depth of involvement and not per se on the harming only or potentially seeing harming as an indicator of involvement. Uh, might help if I could see the question. I mean, certainly there were different forms of self-harm and some of those were certainly less, less damaging than others. Um, that is certainly my impression. Um, like drinking hot boiling water is not as potentially injurious as striking oneself in the head with something. John, I've just placed uh, Daniel's two questions or his question in the follow-up in the chat box to you, if you're able to see that, if that will help you in answering. I'm not sure about variation in the amount. Certainly, as I hopefully mentioned, um, variation in form. And what accounts for more or less self-harm? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Daniel, I've turned your mic on if you'd like to come on and, and maybe say something to help, you know, add some context to the question or maybe engage. Yeah, with thanks. Thanks, yes. Cindy. Hey, John, how you doing? I was better before your questions, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I'm just really just, first, there was a fascinating talk, but I'm, I just... I'm wondering if, you know, there's so much in, in the US where we see self-harm as an individual pathology um, and, and, and here you're looking at how it, it's really a cultural practice in many ways. And so I'm just, even as a cultural practice, I'm just wondering, not just variation in forms, I guess, as you put it, but variations in, in are they some people doing it more to, to indicate more affiliation. I got that sense from some of your talk, but I just wanted to hear more about that. Um, two things, um, very briefly with regard to your last question. Um, that's a tough call as to whether um, more involvement is being shown by what one is doing. Um, the, the greater the self-harm, I think it does logically follow, the more barica one must um, have to be experiencing or participating in to keep one from severe physical harm. Um, it's also got to be pointed out that in keeping with what you were just saying, many, many Moroccans um, do feel that what these types of Sufis are doing, these particular Sufis who are engaging in acts of self-harm, they um, do perceive of them as having um, some sort of malady. Um, I mean, the term sick would, was literally used as in, yes, a psychological or emotional problem. That's certainly um, from what I gathered uh, discussing this with many Moroccans, that certainly wasn't true of all Moroccans, but for some Moroccans, they, you know, 
did see such practices as um, try to use your phrasing as uh, a form of pathology or illness. But those engaging in such practices um, certainly do not and um, really in diametrically opposed terms mm. they're actually beneficial for them yeah thanks john you're welcome thank you for your question so send the question over we actually have another question in and coming in the q a but i'll ask this first of the other two panelists and then uh move on to anil's question and that's this, even though it was John's paper that dealt with self-harm, I wonder if, if both Elaine and Christina could speak to, um, at least in the context of your work and your presentation, where self-harm fits into it, because it's obviously, uh, you know, when someone's uh, in an addictive situation, or even you mentioned working in the music industry, or even the uh, phytosemiotics, like just the way we control our visual and auditory spaces, and 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 have uh, and have those uh, polluting influences that come in that a lot of shamanic work, especially for those of us in the West that have lost connection to our to roots otherwise, uh, seek out. We're trying to to limit components of self harm, even as we might engage in in certain practices and rituals that might at least initially cause some some harm to the body and to the psyche while while both break apart and realign. So I, I just wonder if you might each speak to. The, the role of self-harm in the people that you work with and the people that you studied and how it relates as a, a sort of component of healing. I don't know that I have much to say on it. Um, I'll think about it, but do you have any comments, Elaine? I do. Um, as far as the people that were participating in my co-inquiry group, there were um, a number of people who had had suicidal attempts or you know had had been very close to suicide attempts that was their turning point to actually start working with the medicine so i don't know if that's really answers that question um but that was sort of the experience in 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 our in our group is that for a number of people that was their turning point um, to realizing that they were needing to try something different than what they were doing mm -hmm. um with the kichwa that i work with uh, indigenous group of the western amazon um, you know they definitely don't necessarily talk about self-harm and i don't think they practice it that i know of it's a pretty uh you know pretty wholesome bunch of people, I guess is the best way to put it. But uh, I'm looking at what this person, AK Maheshwari has said in the Q&A about using the language of self-transcendence through bodily paths. And I think that's definitely a better um, uh, description of what they would be doing in the Amazon and with Amazonian shamanism. Um, again, there's not a lot of talk of self because it is, um, it's, well, it's a culture with a lot of personal autonomy, but there's not a lot of focus on the self necessarily, um, so much as there is the family, right? And then the community secondary to that, but the family is the main thing, but there is a lot of transcendence through, especially through bodily paths. It's a very embodied sort of practice, Amazonian shamanism is, so I would definitely agree with that language. Yeah, I think that might have been the genesis of my question too. Is that it's just a, a, a an experience that that in certain contexts is to be avoided, or transcended, or one that one experiences transcendence through participating in. And I, I think uh, Anil's question actually gets to the heart of what I was asking. More so, uh, before we go on to the other question in the chat, um, John, did you have anything to to add to that? This notion of uh, the term self harm sounding like body centric language, maybe not in the right way, but using something about self transcendence through bodily paths. How do the people you work with speak of this practice? Do they, do they use an equivalent term to self harm or, or do they speak about it differently? They don't, uh, they don't phrase it in terms of self harm, no. At least okay. not to the um, best of my memory or knowledge. I, I don't ever recall seeing that in the literature. Um, they simply do these acts and 
they typically don't like talking about them. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and I think, again, that's at least in part because at least some Moroccans see what they are doing as um, a sign of ill health and some Moroccans would see what they were doing. And certainly many, many Muslims would as shameful because of course in Islam, one is not supposed to harm the self. One is not supposed to harm the body. And in the ethnographic literature, uh, the, at least what I'm aware of, the terms that are typically used are self, self mutilation, self, self harm, self injury, and I never actually saw any self mutilation, so I avoided that extreme one. But they don't they don't categorize what they're doing in such terms to the to the best of my knowledge. They don't use such categories. We have a question in the chat for Elaine. Thank you for that clarification, John. I think uh, Anil brings up an interesting fissure there in terms of perspective of these practices. Um, the question is for Elaine. Mark Flanagan asks, would you be able to elaborate a little more on the regimen that you use to help heal your illness? Was it informal or with guidance of some kind? Westernized like MDMA assisted psychotherapy or indigenous ayahuasca ceremony with traditional leaders and shaman? Yeah, well, I did a combination of things, but I, I worked with shamans in ayahuasca ceremonies, uh, multiple um, ceremonies, and then I worked with guides and with the psilocybin medicine and and combination also in a, a psilocybin MDMA session with a guide, and um, and then I had some of my own self-guided experiences with MDMA, but I did the intentional ones were all with um, people who were trained to work with the medicines and yeah. Um, I have done some microdosing, but again, I find that the higher doses is where the healing for these kinds of um, difficult to treat conditions really seems to come through for people. I mean, in, in my group, the people that were in there had tried so many different things and they were like me. They got to the point where it was like, nothing is working. I'm willing to, you know, go to another country and do two weeks worth of, you know, ceremony somewhere or, um, you know, try, try Ibogaine or yeah, there were a lot of different medicines that people tried that helped them when nothing else did. And, um, and all those people did work in um, situations where there were ceremony and intention. Thank you. There's a comment in the chat um, from, I just lost it. Oh, from Cheryl, uh, who says another point is to show the power, um, I'm assuming, of the self-harm of the saints in Allah. If the saints can protect against such harms, what other help can they provide? And I think this is an interesting question. Again, you know, maybe that was a comment, but maybe to John into the whole group is when we're talking about self-harm, what, what self is it that we're talking about? Um, as a religion professor, I know that, you know, um, Folks that I've studied with through the years, whether it be Houston Smith, Joseph Campbell, and others, make a distinction between uh, a, a quick metaphor is when we walk into a room with a series of, uh, of fluorescent lights on, we can say the light is on or the lights are on. We can talk about the individual bulbs or we can talk about the light as a, as a collective entity. And if we talk about the individual bulbs, one of the things that happens with the individual bulbs is they burn out and break, right? And they wear down and then they're replaced. And so if we identify with the bulb, then we are identifying with a course of suffering and degradation and disintegration. If we identify with the light, right, then that changes our association with the body and the treatment of the body and even the decay of the body because the, the decay of the body becomes not then a trap but a release of the core identity back into its larger and more eternal essence. And so I'm wondering what you folks think about that. 
know if there's a question in there somewhere. <laughs> we need to riff on that a little bit. Seems like a great idea to me. I think um, from a Sufi perspective, I think that you've named it very well. And that when a lot of the Sufi purification on the path is to get rid of your individual ego identity light bulb, if you will, mm -hmm. and become one with the light. And that may be what these people are experiencing, showing, having a heightened experience of it because there are witnesses. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how it works, but I do think that that light bulb versus the lights is a really good analogy for what's, what this path is about, the Sufi path. Other questions, comments? Well, this has been an absolutely wonderful panel. Um, thank you all so much for you giving us a lot to think about. Um, the, the breadth of these presentations, I, I, I think are spectacular. And I also, I'm really intrigued at the way they actually speak to one another, even though maybe on the surface, the first two cover a different range uh, than the, the final. And we, we're dealing across, of course, as anthropologists, we're crossing from Abrahamic to non-Abrahamic traditions, which gives us a whole different set of cultural associations and ways of thinking about these terms like the self and the ego and the body and that. And even within that, while we're honoring the, the uniqueness of those traditions, there's this interesting continuity that we're seeing. That is, uh, these practices are trying to move people out of the private self and into a, a context of deep connection to the other. And that's at least one of my main takeaways from all three of the papers. And so thank you all so much for that. Thank you, Andy. Thanks Thank for putting this much, all Andy. together. And thanks to Elaine and uh, John for your great papers. Thank you. We have, we have another session. We have just a couple of sessions left for the evening. We have a break now. And then at three o'clock, we have our keynote session for the day. And that's a round table discussion that's going to be chaired by Dr. Nicole Torres, who's our journal's managing editor and a longtime Anthropology of Consciousness member She's been popping in and out of sessions today, and she'll be leading a roundtable discussion of water activists and water protectors, um, some indigenous, some not, uh, in a pretty fascinating conversation about spiritual activism through, through water and our connection to water. Um, and that begins at three o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and that will be a roundtable discussion. The link is there in the chat, and it's also in our, on our communities page. Um, and then the other thing is our Zoom happy hour tonight for those who are able to make it after that. And I believe that starts at, that'll be 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, 6 p.m. Pacific. The link to join the happy hour has been put on the uh, conference communities page. I'll pop it again in the chat. We'd love to see all of you there. But uh, try to make it at least to the to the roundtable panel. I think that you'll very much enjoy that. Oh yeah, the links been posted in the chat a couple times for the Zoom happy hour as well. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for being a part of this yeah. conference so far. It's been absolutely spectacular. Oh oh, and yes, I've just been reminded about our conference, our after party after Zoom that will be on Abracadabra on Twitch TV, which is a, a group that we're partnering with of activists environmental activists and electronic music producers um, that have a lot of overlap with consciousness studies and as well, because one of the, I'll just say this before we end, one of the real goals for us is to uh, take the wonderful work that you folks are doing and not have it just die in these sessions and die in the academy, but actually expose the ideas and expose the work to other folks who aren't maybe working in these settings all the time and who don't have the luxury of being able to attend these conferences, but make sure that we're getting these ideas out in front of larger communities. And so that'll be, that'll be a part of the Twitch affiliation as well. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Andy. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Christina, Elaine, quick, quick questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Christina, the panel you were referring to um, that we were on together at AAA, that was the one dealing with um, paranormal phenomena. Am I right about that? Um, could be. <laughs> you want me to look it up real quick? I don't remember. I, I did. Uh, I think I did a paper on the dieta, shamanic dieta. Uh, was it in Montreal? No, it was in Washington, D.C. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. I'm thinking of a separate one. 2017. Uh, 
thank you very much for your paper. Really enjoyed it. Thank you again. Oh, thank you. Yeah, me too. We do so many of these conferences together. <laughs> they all bleed together. I've had participants from this conference writing me saying, what's my paper on? <laughs> <That was cool. laughs> yeah, exactly. We find mm -hmm. so many of them and we're just inundated. So I, I super interesting, super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, y'all. It was thank fun. All right. Thanks. Thank you. It was. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Andy.